AD 1001. In this year, there were constant hostilities in England because of the Danish army, and they harried and burned almost everywhere. And they went about at will, encountering no resistance. No fleet by sea nor levies on land dared approach them, however far inland they went. Time after time, the more urgent a thing was, the greater was the delay from one hour to the next. And all the while, the king and his councillors were allowing the strength of their enemies to increase. In the end, our naval and land preparations were a complete failure and succeeded only in adding to the distress of the people, wasting money and encouraging their enemy. In every way, it was a hard time for they never ceased from their evil deeds. No English king has had as bad a press as Ethelred the Unready. Sermons preached in his own lifetime in churches like this one, Bradford-on-Avon, which he perhaps built, unmistakably accuse his government of incompetence, irresolution, and even downright treachery. Modern historians have found all this a bit hard to swallow. But anyone who's lived through, say, the early 70s and the fall of President Nixon knows how hard moral failure at the top can hit the nerve of even a modern industrial state. How much more for an early society like the Anglo-Saxons, where the charismatic role of the king was vital in preserving the health of the body politic. And that's why ordinary Anglo-Saxons, when they knelt in this spot a thousand years ago, prayed for Ethelred in the same breath as they prayed for the fruits of the earth. So what was it that brought down Europe's most prestigious kingship? Was Ethelred really to blame? Was he unready? The record of his government is still there to be seen. So judge for yourself. AD 979, the end of the Anglo-Saxon Golden Age. Sunset on the empire built by Alfred the Great and Athelstan. There had been bad omens, famine, a comet, the young King Edward was unstable and unpopular. On the evening of March the 18th, Edward was murdered at his royal hall on the Great Hill in the Gap of Corf in Dorset by a palace faction intent on putting his young half-brother Ethelred on the throne. The same year, a cloud red as blood was seen with the appearance of fire. It took the form of rays of light of various colours, and at the first streak of dawn, it vanished. The seers and astronomers who gathered round the ten-year-old king to watch this portent knew that it foretold evil. Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child. The biblical warning cast a shadow over the rain, even at the coronation itself. England was the richest country in Europe, and the news spread abroad in no time that she now had a boy king, that her riches might now be easy pickings. The Vikings returned. In 980, the very next year, Danish fleets devastated Thanet in Kent. At Southampton, the citizens were killed or carried off into slavery. They pillaged Portland and Dorset, regions free from pirate attack since the days of Alfred the Great. The next year, Padstow was wasted, and great destruction wrought along the coast of Devon and Cornwall, and so it was to go on through the 80s. These attacks were not like those faced by Alfred, for these were not Viking armies trying to settle and plough for a living. They were tough professional armies who were out to plunder, to extort money and treasure. 
The young king and his advisors had no answer to them, and their helplessness is the theme of one of the great pieces of historical writing of the period, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. This is by far our most valuable account of Ethelred's reign. It was written during these years by an anonymous cleric and is preserved here in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. And here it is. This isn't the author's own manuscript. Uh, unfortunately, that is lost. But this is a famous copy done in Anglo-Saxon at Peterborough about a century after these events. It's a year-by-year -year impassioned account of the failures of Ethelred's government. The author was clearly able to revise it after Ethelred's death and inject it with hindsight, but nevertheless, it was obviously kept as a contemporary narrative. The tone's ironic and bitter, like those who fought against the appeasers of Hitler in the 30s. The Danes, for example, in their ravaging of England, always seem to be able to do just as they please. Swahi bewuna weren. Swahi Sif Waldon. And as for the English government, well, they, they can never put a foot right, time and again. And Thorna at them ender ne behold, hit none thing, nothing. They affected nothing. Who was he? Well, the forceful style with its poetic vocabulary suggests he wasn't just a monk in a cloister, but that he was a man used to public speaking, maybe a bishop or a priest. And if he was a Londoner, of so, as some scholars have suggested, then it's not impossible that he could have been the parish priest of a church like St. Mary Le Beau, but we don't know. Simply, we don't know who he was. It's in the 990s that he starts to put his feelings into the narrative, almost as if the urgency of the time demanded someone to tell the truth as it was. And 991 seems to be the key year, because in that year, the government first decided to pay Danegeld, to pay extortion protection money to make the Danes go away. They took that decision after a local defeat in Essex that August. An insignificant event on the wider canvas, but never to be forgotten. In August 991, a Viking army under Olaf Tryggvason, later King of Norway, sailed up the river Blackwater in Essex. 93 ships carrying around 5,000 hardened veterans. They made their camp on a small island now called Northy, a typical Viking base from where they could intercept the river traffic, which then as now stood in the tidal reaches of the river. The Vikings' main object was probably the nearby Anglo-Saxon Bull, the fortified town of Malden, with its supplies of grain and produce and its stocks of merchants' wares. A surviving Anglo-Saxon poem on the battle says that Northey was joined to the mainland by a causeway over which the rising tides came together. The causeway would have been the only means of passage for the Vikings because the surrounding saltings are so marshy. By now, news of the attack had reached the Earl in charge of local defence, and the Home Guard of Essex had blocked the causeway on the landward side. So, as the tide rose and covered the causeway, Olaf and his men could only stand and watch. They called across the water to the English. There's no point in his fighting, in bloodshed. You're rich enough to pay us off. Give us gold and we'll put to sea. The English Earl Britnoth, a towering figure of a man over six and a half feet tall, 65 years old, with a shock of white hair, was one of the old school. Britnoth was not a man to take the easy way out. He replied, listen to me, seamen. We'll give you spears for tribute. You will not win gold so easily. We shall both embrace each other with point and blade, bitter battle play, before we give you tribute. Very well then, the Vikings shouted back. Let us make it a fair fight. Let us come across to your side. Maybe Britnoth hoped to trap them. Perhaps it was just old-fashioned chivalry or a fatal pride. But the Earl agreed. He pulled back, and as the water receded, the Viking troops moved across the wet causeway. The English officers had been hunting, 
and let their hawks fly free to nearby trees and drew their swords ready. Then, says the poem, the slaughterous wolves, the horde of Vikings, passed west over the river. They bore their shields over the gleaming water to the land where Britnoth stood ready with his warriors to oppose them. The battle began. The English stood firm at first, but they were amateurs against professionals, and their towering leader was an easy target. Wounded by a spear shot, he was cut down by Olaf's men. Dismayed, the faint-hearted among the English fled. But a group of Britnoth's friends and retainers refused to give up. Shoulder to shoulder, they fought on, encouraging each other, although the battle was lost. And in this dreadful extremity, the Earl's old companion, Britwold, spoke these immortal lines. Thoughts must be harder, heart braver, courage the greater, as our strength grows less. Here lies our Lord all cut down, hero in the dust. Long may he mourn who thinks of running away from the fight now. I am old, I will not leave the field, but think to lie by my Lord's side, by the man I held so dear. That was the message for Ethelred's generation. But he and they heeded it too little. Soon after this, Ethelred agreed to the first payment of tribute, Danegelt, 10,000 pounds of silver. He was to take this course time and again in the next 20 years. Danegelt has come to symbolize the weakness of Ethelred's government, but paradoxically, the coinage itself is the most spectacular demonstration of the power of Anglo-Saxon kingship. Marion Archibald in the British Museum coin room. Marion, first of all, could you explain uh, what an Anglo-Saxon coin is? Well, perhaps we could look at first at this coin, which is of the long cross type. On the obverse, there is a head and shoulders of the king. This isn't, of course, an actual portrait of the king. It's just an effigy, which is based on a Roman prototype. And around the profile of the king, there is his name and title, Ethelred Rex Angle, uh, short for Ethelred, King of the English. So this is the classic late Saxon penny, is it? The, yes. The, the, the normal currency for an Anglo-Saxon in the street? Yes. There were in the country about 80 mints. Uh, at some periods, the dyes were made centrally and issued to the mints all around the country. At other times, uh, notably towards the end of his reign, when there was great problems with Danish incursions, uh, the dyes were probably made in regional centres around the country, which then distributed their dyes to smaller mints in their localities. So you can actually you can actually see the effect of the Danish invasions mirrored in in the coinage. To some that, extent, yeah. yes. What evidence do you have for the the, the first payment of Danegeld, when presumably very large numbers of coins started yes. to go out of the country? I think that um, there must have been some increase in minting to take account of the payments required to the Danes, and that uh, some bullion that had been stored in the form of plate and so on must have been taken to the mint to be recoined. But I think what it also did was to uh, bring out a lot of stored wealth, stored coin, to be recoined, to be uh, paid in the Danegeld. So England was actually uh, rich in silver in one way or oh, another? Very, very yeah. rich, yes. This splendid coin, which is the only gold coin of uh, Ethelred's reign. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, which was struck at the Mint of Lewis. The prototype for this is a Roman coin. And in this case, it's a coin of uh, the Emperor Maximian, struck about the year 290, which shows, I think you'll agree, an inc incredible parallel on the Anglo-Saxon coin. They've slightly misunderstood the Emperor's shield as the shoulder of a cuirass. Mm. You see the helmet with the radiate crown and the, the detail of the drapery on the bust exactly similar. So they're, they're deliberately making Ethelred out to be a, in the style of a Roman emperor, really, yes. consciously. Yes. yes. It seems uh, really remarkable that through this period of gloom in the Chronicle, this amazingly efficient 
system with its attention to detail still functioning? Oh, yes. I, I think it's exceedingly impressive. Uh, sometimes the, the standard does vary from the Winchester area, for example, where it tends to be heavier, to the Dane law where it tends to be lighter. But it's certainly not haphazard. And on the whole, it's a very impressive demonstration of the way in which the English administration was able to uh, be maintained in the face of enormous difficulties. The imperial gold penny of 1003 shows the helmeted Ethelred in a militant mood, armed and vigilant, ready to protect his flock. Unfortunately, the increasingly paranoid king directed his military energies next, not against hostile armies, but against his own people. In 1002, Danish settlers in England had been there for over a hundred years, ploughing and farming, and also engaging in urban trade, not just in the Danish areas of the east and north, but in Wessex itself. They worked hard, and like everyone else, paid their tithes of livestock to the church at Pentecost, fruits of the earth at all saints. But the paranoid Ethelred had been fed rumours that they intended to depose and murder him, and he sent letters to his agents in all the Boers to massacre the Danes. This insane act can never have been carried out in many places, but in some it was. In Oxford, the Danes fled for protection to St. Frithiswide's church. There, they and their women and children were attacked by a mob inflamed by the government's anti-Danish propaganda. They were burned alive. This terrible act of racism, the massacre of St. Bryce's Day, undid the work of Ethelred's great predecessors who had tried to make the Danes in England feel English. But worse, among the dead was the sister of King Swain of Denmark. As a result, the whole tone of the war now changed. Swain launched a systematic campaign of destruction to bring Ethelred to his knees. At Christmas 1005, Swain launched a great raid through Hampshire up to Reading, burning as he went. Wallingford, a wealthy boor at the crossing of the Thames, Swain burned to the ground, destroying its defences which had been expensively refurbished in stone by the English government. Next day he turned south to Chelsea. Here Ethelred himself had endowed a church in memory of his murdered brother and paid for new fabric, part of which still survives. Swain spent the night here and looted all its treasures. Leaving a fiery trail of devastation, the Danes then moved up onto the Berkshire Downs and along the Great Ridgeway the prehistoric track which was the chief ancient route into the heart of Wessex. Their object was Cookhamsley Knob, a prominent mound on the top of the Downs, where the 7th century West Saxon King Quichhelm was said to be buried. The reason? The English had threatened great things, says the chronicler. They said that if ever the Danes reached Cookhamsley, they would never again see the sea. Go to Cookhamsley today. And inside the copse, the great burial mound, now robbed out, is still to be seen. Here, at this royal meeting place, Swain waited. But Ethelred did not meet him. He brought no royal army to this spot to try the issue once and for all. Swain marched back to the sea, flaunting his loot past Winchester, Ethelred's capital. There, says the chronicler, the citizens saw a confident and arrogant host passing their gates, bringing provisions and treasures from more than 50 miles inland. After that humiliation, the chronicler gets more and more involved and more and more frustrated 
as it becomes apparent that nobody is going to act to save England. Christmas 10.06 to 7. The terror inspired by the host grew so great that man ne maite ye thinkan, who man he of erda adrifan shulda, or the thisna erd with he ye hildan. Everybody was incapable of devising a plan to get them out of the country or to hold the country against them. The king met his council and decided to negotiate a truce and pay yet another tribute for the good of the people, the chronicler says, distasteful as it might be to all of them. Perhaps those were the very words spoken in council. Anyway, in the new year, the whole of the English nation provided provisions for the Danish army and a tribute of 36,000 pounds of silver was paid. For Ethelred's advisers, the time had come for positive action. <laughs> In his royal hall, goaded by his failures, Ethelred makes a public pronouncement on just kingship. Written by Archbishop Wolfstan of York, this law code reflects the mounting fears of the Anglo-Saxon ruling class. Disloyalty, desertion, depletion of the church's power by Danegelt, and above all, fear of the disruption of the social hierarchy and the king's sacred, untouchable eminence. The message was clear. God was no longer with the nation. The land must be purified. We must all love and honor one God and completely cast out every heathen practice. And let us loyally hold to one royal Lord and defend life and land together as best we can. And from our inmost hearts beseech almighty God for help. But the hawks in Ethelred's Witten, his cabinet, wanted military action. They wanted war, not prayers or tribute giving. And the answer they came up with was a fleet to fight the Danes on their own terms. The king gave orders that ships should be speedily built through the whole of England. About 300 large warships, each crewed by 50 or 60 men with a complement of heavily armed troops. At last, Ethelred was showing the warlike instinct of his ancestors. The fleet was the biggest ever assembled by an Anglo-Saxon king, and it came together here in Sandwich Bay, the strategic point on the tip of southeastern England, where a Danish fleet, having coasted down the continental seaboard, would come across the channel at its narrowest point. Sandwich Bay also gave Ethelred's fleet a secure harbour. Sandwich itself, which was one of the main ports of the Anglo-Saxon period, although its waterfront's now silted up and it lies over there about two miles from the sea. The hopes of the whole of England were high that summer, says the chronicler, but on this occasion no more than any other were we destined to enjoy the good fortune of successful naval operations. The whole sorry story began typically with a stupid wrangle in a court rife with rumour and disloyalty. One of the king's courtiers, Beortrich, made accusations about another one, Wolfnoth, to the king. Wolfnoth immediately fled with 20 ships, and Beortrich then asked the king to give him 80 ships to follow Wolfnoth and to bring him back dead or alive, to win himself a great fame, adds the chronicler sarcastically. This request was granted, but Beortrich's 80 ships ran into a storm and were smashed to pieces. When this news reached the king and his councillors stationed here in Sandwich Bay, they were thrown into confusion, and they decided, amazingly, to call the whole thing off and to go home. In this manner, says the chronicler, so inconsiderately, the efforts of the whole nation were cast to nothing. Paralyzed by his misfortune, Ethelred retired to Bath and issued a penitential edict with masses against the pagans. He declared a kind of moral state of emergency. A new coin was also minted, bearing the Lamb of God and the Holy Spirit to symbolize the wisdom of God brought to the English people. But the English people 
were increasingly despairing of Christian wisdom. The terrifying decline of rulership brought Ethelred's bishops face to face with their worst fears, lapse into paganism. The decay of Christian worship as the bonds of society were broken down. The laws of this time speak of juju men, witches and spell workers, magical stones, wells and trees, worshippers of idols and heathen gods, of sun and moon, fire and flood. Preachers preached sermons on false gods, talking fearfully of Odin and Thor in the same breath as the chronicler talked of Swain and his army. AD 1010. For three months they harried and burned the land and even penetrated into the uninhabited fens, slaying men and cattle, and burning through the fens. And when the enemy was in the east, then our levies were mustered in the west. And when they were in the south, then we were in the north. And in the end, there was no leader willing to raise levies, but all fled as quickly as they could. All these misfortunes befell us by reason of bad policy. In the tribute was not offered them in time, but when they'd done their worst. Notwithstanding all this truce and peace and tribute, they went about everywhere and robbed and slew our unhappy people. They had by this time overrun East Anglia, part of Northamptonshire, Cambridgeshire, half of Huntingdonshire, Bedfordshire, Essex, Hertfordshire, Buckinghamshire, Middlesex, and Oxfordshire and south of the Thames, Berkshire, part of Wiltshire, Hampshire, Surrey, Sussex, and finally all of Kent. The worst moment of the war was now at hand. On September the 8th, the Danish army attacked Canterbury, and after a 20-day siege, broke in through treachery and plundered and burned Christchurch Cathedral, then, as now, the head church for Christianity in England. And among their many prisoners was Archbishop Alfie himself. From that time until the following Easter, the Archbishop remained in Danish captivity whilst they tried to negotiate a fat ransom for their prisoner. But why, in all that time, did Ethelred and his government not try to organize a, a crusade against the invaders. As it was, the Danes were able to retire with their prisoner to their fleet based at Greenwich. Greenwich was an early Anglo-Saxon trading post downriver from London. Its contacts have always been with the sea. Here in 1012, the Viking fleet was moored and their camp lay between ditches on the site of the old town. The terrible events which follow happened here on the exact site of the present church of St. Alfie. Ethelred's council had met in London at Easter and agreed on a 48,000 pound tribute, 12 million silver coins, but they seemed to have done nothing to free the archbishop. The money was delivered here to Greenwich in the week after Easter, but despite that the atmosphere turned nasty. On Saturday the 19th of April, the Danes became incensed against Archbishop Alfie because he would not allow a ransom to be paid for him. They were also drunk on plundered French wine. On the Saturday night, they led him to their tribunal on this spot and pelted him to death with animal bones. And one struck him on the skull with the blunt end of an axe head. And with that blow, says the chronicler, he sank down and his holy blood fell upon the earth and his holy soul was sent forth to God's kingdom. In 1013, the Anglo-Saxon Empire finally fell apart. Demoralized by devastation, the West Saxon councillors offered Swain the crown. Ethelred was now a king without a kingdom. After Christmas, he sailed off to exile in Normandy, where his wife's father was duke. 
he set foot on the soil of the continent near Coutances on the Cherbourg Peninsula. He had reigned 35 years, longer than any of his great predecessors. Le often men, ye knoweth that soth is, this world is on offste and it nearleth them ende, and the hit is on worlde are swaling swa wirse. New Year, 1014. Archbishop Wolfstan gives a sermon to his dwindling congregation. We may imagine it in the Anglo Saxon church at Bradford on Avon in Wiltshire, which may have been built by Ethelred. But England's expert on kingship now has no new answers. For long now nothing has prospered. There has been devastation in every part over and again. And for long now the English have been entirely without victory. And the Vikings so strong with God's consent that in battle one will often put to flight ten. We repay them continually and they humiliate us daily. They ravage and burn and plunder and rob. And indeed, what is there in all these events but the wrath of God, clear and visible towards this nation? Let us love God and follow God's laws, and very diligently practice what we promised when we received baptism. May God help us. Amen. On February the 2nd, it may have seemed that Wolfstan's prayer was answered. Waiting with his English hostages at his base at Gainsborough in Lincolnshire on the River Trent, Swain died. Then all the fleet chose his 20-year-old son as king, a young man destined to play an important role in European history and to become a legend into the bargain, Canute. Canute's father had been acknowledged king by the English, so the fleet at Gainsborough doubtless hoped that Canute would be accepted in his turn without a struggle. But back in the heartland of Wessex, the English councillors, the Witan, the wise men, had another idea. They sent to Ethelred in Normandy and asked him to come back and be their king again, providing he ruled them more justly than he'd done before. And he replied, promising that he would be a good king to them, providing that everything that had happened could be forgiven and forgotten. Well, this amazing turnabout shows us, first of all, what reservoirs of feeling the royal family could still command after 30 years of mayhem. But it also gives us the crux of the story, because it's the first time that the chronicler specifically says that people thought Ethelred had been a bad king. He had not been Ritlich. And we know a great deal about what people thought kings should be at that time. Ethelred's chief advisor, Archbishop Wolfstan, had written a whole treatise on it. Edgar, Athelstan, Alfred, they had been good kings. And why? Because they were mature, prudent, far-sighted, and hard to overcome in any warfare. They had greatness of spirit, but they also struck people around them with dread, a very necessary quality to be God's vicar on earth. But with Ethelred, we get a different impression. Imagine if you were at a, a, a royal hunting party at Old Windsor in 981. The man that you met then would certainly strike you as a very attractive man. He, he had a beautiful face. His manners were very graceful. He was very elegant. He wasn't a fool or a coward, men said of him. But at the same time, as our chronicler shows, he was a man who chose his advisors badly. He was prone to act with impulsive cruelty. He couldn't act decisively at the right moment. In short, he was a man who was not Ethelred, which in Anglo-Saxon means noble counsel. He was Unred, no counsel, bad, even evil counsel. That malicious Anglo-Saxon pun, which we modernize inaccurately to Ethelred the Unready, sums it up. For as our chronicler sees it, it was Ethelred's Unredus, which were the, the root of all the trouble. And in the final struggle with Canute, he sees, as it were, an old man facing a young terrorist, an opportunist, malleable, but ruthless thug. Fired with a new enthusiasm for military affairs, Ethelred marched against Canute at Gainsborough. 
but the Dane put to sea and landed his hostages at Sandwich, having cut off their hands, ears and noses. So, says the chronicler, the unhappy people were left in the lurch by him. By now both sides were rehearsed in mindless barbarity, and one king as bad as the next. For the whole of the next year, 1015, England was devastated up and down by rival armies led by Canute, Ethelred, and Ethelred's renegade son, Edmund. The issue devolved upon control of London. Ethelred's reign reached its climax here in 1016, but as usual, Ethelred himself missed it. He died on St. George's Day, England's patron saint. It's ironic, isn't it? He was buried here at St. Paul's with great honor after a life of much hardship and many difficulties, our chronicler adds, is one real word of sympathy for the king. You could still see Ethelred's tomb here, until 1666, when, along with the rest of old St. Paul's, it was destroyed in the Great Fire of London. But maybe his bones still lie here in a common grave somewhere in these little gardens around the back of Wren's church. Immediately after this, the councillors in Wessex elected Canute King. They were obviously fed up to the back teeth with war. But here in London, the unbowed citizens who'd fought for so long and so hard chose Ethelred's young son, Edmund. And in the dramatic months that followed, Edmund gained himself a nickname very different from his father, Edmund Ironside. Edmund raised a small army in Wessex and in June won a victory at Pencilwood. Then, after midsummer, at Sherston on the Avon, he attacked the Danes, who were reinforced by several English leaders, including the treacherous Edrich of Mercia. There he won a desperate two-day battle. Then, raising levies for a third time, in a daring maneuver, he marched on London, keeping north of the Thames all the time, and relieved Canute's siege. Two days after that, he forced a crossing at Brentford and put Canute to flight, driving him into Kent. He beat him again at Otford and pursued him to Sheppey. At this point, the turncoat Edrich of Mercia changed sides, and Edmund received him back. Canute, meanwhile, transported his battered army over the Thames estuary into the River Crouch in Essex. And there, in October, he was caught by Edmund, now the darling of the English. The date of their fateful encounter was the 18th of October, 1016. The place, Ashingdon, the hill of ash trees. Local tradition says that Edmund's army camped on Ashingdon Hill the night before the battle. Here in the churchyard, fragments of chain mail and an arrowhead have turned up. Canute may have camped on Canudon Hill, whose church tower stands out prominently to the east. At dawn, the English moved forward in separate divisions, Mercians, West Saxons and East Angles. The whole of the English nation, says the chronicler, with pardonable exaggeration. Canute had his back to the sea. He had no time now to embark. He had to fight, and he had nowhere to run. Canute decided to advance and moved down to an intermediate height in the low ground east of Ashingdon. Then Edmund charged, heavily armed men in the front ranks. The battle was long and fierce, but, says the chronicler, then Alderman Edrich did as he had often done before. He was the first to start the flight with the Mercians and thus betrayed his liege lord and all the people of England. The Danish side later claimed that Edrich had previously agreed to do this with Canute. Edmund's hopes were dashed. He fought on bravely until nightfall and even managed to extricate a remnant with which he hoped to continue the war. But the rest of his army and its best leaders were wiped out. All the flower of England was destroyed there. The country was now desperate for peace. 
Their counsellors persuaded the kings to be reconciled, and they met on the River Severn in Gloucestershire. The place was then an island called Alney, though now just a meadow. But the ancient church of Deerhurst, where the kings established their friendship, still stands and is one of the greatest surviving Anglo-Saxon churches. Here they gave oaths on holy relics and became partners and sworn brothers, exchanging gifts, clothing and weapons. If Canute was not already baptised, then that ceremony may have taken place here too, at this splendid Anglo-Saxon font. Maybe Archbishop Wolfstan himself was his sponsor. The point behind the ritual and the etiquette was a political one. A deal was made here that Edmund should keep Wessex and Canute succeed to Mercia and the North. Something had been saved out of the wreck, but not for long. Within a month, the heroic Edmund died mysteriously and Canute succeeded to the whole kingdom. Malleable and opportunist, Canute was quickly encouraged by Archbishop Wolfstan to emulate the great West Saxon kings of the past. As always, the Catholic Church shaped the mentality of barbarian kings in the Dark Age West, and the former terrorist soon became the Lord's anointed. Hypocritical to our eyes, perhaps, but most Dark Age kings were like spoiled children, and their moral sense was unrefined. They needed a wolf stand to tell them what to say. I will be a grateful lord to you all and a faithful observer of God's dues, said Canute's letter to the people of England. I thank almighty God for his mercy that I have so settled the great dangers which were threatening us. There's a final chapter to this story. Three years after he became king of all the English, Canute returned to Ashingdon with Archbishop Wolfstan and the English bishops, and he dedicated this church to the souls of all the men who died in the battle here. Now, it's not impossible that our chronicler was present that day, and if he was, I wonder what that bitter and ironic observer would have made of those events here on the hill of ash trees. He had completed his chronicle within months of the final defeat of the English, and after that he wrote no more. To him, I suppose it must have been small consolation that Canute and his Viking leaders in time would become good Christian Englishmen. To him at that moment, it must have felt that a line of kings had ended which extended back through Alfred the Great for 500 years to the time when the English first came into these islands. Apart from one small domestic incident, King Alfred the Great enjoyed a better reputation. But how much do you know about him? Sky Digital Views press red to do our quiz. Coming up on UK TV History, premiere Great Raids and Escapes begins on the beach at Dunkirk. <laughs>